Hello, and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show, featuring Jason Zook. In uncertain times, we must change our focus and priorities. This show will highlight social justice issues with the goal of expanding minds and increasing unity, love, and mutual respect for ourselves and our planet. We support the Black Lives Matter movement. Our show aspires to promote social spirituality, which simply means that by coming together, we can solve any of our problems, including the goal of bringing an end to all forms of hate, discrimination, bias, or oppression. We must protect our environment, reform our criminal justice system, and protect every citizen from police brutality. When we come together, it becomes possible to bridge the gaps that plague our society and divide us from within. We the people means everyone. Hello and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show. This is Jason Zook. It's a great pleasure I have the opportunity of introducing special guest Danielle Sundberg to the show today. Danielle is a transformational coach, an entrepreneur, a Reiki master, attorney, speaker, founder, advisor, and mom. As I just stated, Danielle is a former attorney turned wellness entrepreneur, consciousness expert, and transformational coach. After leaving behind the traditional definition of success as a big law litigator in Washington, D.C., Danielle traveled the world exploring how to create her life on her own terms. Through this journey, she became an expert in Eastern energy practices that she incorporates into her work as a transformational coach, advisor, founder of health and wellness brand, AMA Healthing, A-M-M-A Healing. I'll say that one more again. Through this journey, she became an expert in Eastern energy practices that she incorporates into her work as a transformational coach, advisor, and founder of health and wellness brand, A-M-M-A Healing. As a coach, Danielle works with clients who dare to live extraordinary lives by moving from their zone of expertise to their zone of genius. She's an expert in drawing out the possibilities in people, even when they believe it's impossible. Additionally, Danielle is an advisor to futurists and social impact companies, sought after speakers and writers, and most recently began her journey into motherhood. It's a great pleasure that I welcome Danielle to the show. Welcome to the show, Danielle. Wow. Who are you talking about? Is that me? Great <laughs> <laughs> to be here with you, Jason. Wow. Thank you. I, I, I just, you could tell I get excited when I have someone like you on the show because you're a fellow attorney, you're spiritual. You chose from being a big lawyer, big law lawyer in DC. And I used to live in DC when I went to Georgetown. I remember what it's like up there. I think it's like one in four people is either a lawyer, a military personnel person, a government for the, a government employee, or a, 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 a guest, a, you know, a visitor. And so <laughs> what I want to ask is, because you know, you and I talked, we had the benefit of talking before we did our interview today. And I, I love talking to other people who are, you know, share similar viewpoints. Like you and I are both attorneys and we both had a calling to do spirituality as part of our focus, or maybe, maybe our main focus, we'll see what the future holds. And for me, I should say, and, and as a result of that, I wanted to ask you, how did you start spirituality as your path after becoming an attorney? It definitely did not come to me as I was leaving my law firm. It wasn't like I quit knowing I need to go be spiritual and then create a career doing that. And it sort of unfolded naturally, which is how things really tend to go. <laughs> you can lay the best plans, but life just does what it does. So when I left my firm, all I really knew was that I needed to go find out what it meant to create life on my terms. And I had no idea what those were because my whole life had been a buildup of creating success on other people's terms, on my parents, on society, on authority figures that I respected and admired, they all showed me and modeled for me the ways to become successful. And that included studying really hard, getting advanced degrees, getting a prestigious job, working really hard in that job, getting promoted in that job, right? Until you get, you know, the corner office and, and the Lamborghini or whatever the equivalent is for you. And I thought I had climbed to the top rung of that ladder when I got the job at my law firm. 
because for for a young attorney, that's sort of like the the top of the ivory tower, and you kind of get to relax and finally exhale that you had put in all this work and then you've been validated by a firm that's going to pay you way too much money. And so I thought that that was it. I had done it, but that's never it. It's never done. There's always another rung on the ladder. There's always more you can do. There's more um, positions you can have in the law firm in different groups. You can become a partner. You can become a managing partner. It never, ever ends. And so I saw my future in front of me right down the hall because I saw the partners in their corner offices and I projected myself into, you know, 30 years into the future and (sighs) it just turned my stomach. And so when I left, it was, well, what is it that I envisioned myself for 30 years wanting to be doing? Like, what does it turn my stomach? And not only that, like what makes me inspired? And I had no freaking clue no idea. And that was really humbling and also really scary to be like, I don't know who I am and what I want. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing because you're resonating with me right now. When I became an attorney in 2001, that's dating my age right now. I did exactly everything you just said. I did what society expects you to do. I went into student loan debt. I became an attorney. I got my advanced degree from Georgetown, prestigious university. I came out of law school with all that debt and had a struggle. I had to struggle to find a job. I, I, it was right after 9-11. I got out of my master's program and moved to Florida uh, in August of 2011, ready to start a job. And guess what? I started my first job at a state court job making minimum pay that you'd make as a lawyer, 38000 That's t- That's not much then and that's peanuts now. And some of those jobs still pay that low amount. And I don't understand how someone go to law school, work for the state and make, make lower than you make as a teacher, right? And when you described the corner office and going down the hall and seeing your life in 30 years, I will say this. I've said this on other episodes. I have a lot of lawyer friends I respect deeply, and they're they're geniuses in the legal craft. But you take a step back. They step out of the office. You go downstairs to have dinner with them, and you ask them about their personal life. They're probably divorced. Uh, I'm, I'm just generalizing, but a lot of lawyers suffer with addiction. A lot of lawyers suffer with depression. A lot of lawyers have very failed relationships. They, you, you know, if you go to any continuing legal education course for, for any bar, I'm in five bars. So if you, if you get in touch with any of those bar associations and look at their CLE programming, you're going to find a lot of stuff about how to, how to be balanced, how to be more well-rounded, how to take care of yourself. And I just think too many lawyers are so focused on the material. They're not spiritual at all. Most of the people I know who are lawyers have a, a difficult time struggling with what I do or what you might do. Because they look at it from a different set of lens, like a different Completely. set of lens, right? <laughs> you and I are what I would call exceptions to the lawyer rule. Yeah. <laughs> and, see the big ahead. picture from a much more <laughs> diversified approach, right? I find so much value. I mean, I worked as a lawyer today for several hours and did my day job. And then I was so excited about our interview today. I was like, I'm so excited. I get to interview Danielle. She's a fellow attorney. She's spiritual and she's pursuing her own path. She's a a trailblazer, a solopreneur, a sole entrepreneur, right? You know? Mm -hmm. And, And so for me, having the ability to kind of just have this episode today as something out there for other lawyers, other people who are interested in pursuing their spiritual paths. I think we cover a lot with that just by our conversation today. And I want to thank you for coming on the show to do that because it's important. And it takes a lot of courage to leave that really cushy, lush office environment that underneath the surface probably makes most lawyers miserable. I'm not trying to knock the legal profession, but I'm going to say that a lot of law firms are very poorly managed. They treat their attorneys like I would probably treat my birds better than they treat their attorneys. Because, you know, mm-hmm. lawyer prison, as we call it as a joke, the, you know what I'm talking about, those firms that have the turning, the revolving door. Oh, you're going to work. We're going to work you to death. And then you can leave. Like there's no, but they don't instill those values of what we're about. And I want to ask right. you about that. Looking at your own experiences as an attorney, what did you find was the greatest shortcoming that you had as an experience as a new lawyer? Meaning, what do you think that the legal profession should do more of that they don't do to newly admitted attorneys? And what do you think could spirituality could do to help attorneys get a bigger focus on what they need to do in order to be a better, better, well-rounded law firm business and just in general clientele. I think that this applies to, you know, anyone who's in a profession, 
that they're either starting out in or pivoting to, or they've just gotten a promotion in it, or it just offers them growth, right? So, so for me, I also didn't go straight into a law firm right out of law school. I also clerked for a judge and same, same story, not, not the best pay. But so what, what I found when I transitioned into the law firm was that they really press on the button of imposter syndrome. And I felt like I was putting on my mom's, you know, suit and her heels kind of anyway, going into this office where I didn't really belong. I had no idea what was going on. I didn't know, you know, the norms, the, the culture of the place to begin with, let alone like being just a young professional and hearing my elders speak in rapid fire terms about cases and, and all the jargon I'm, you know, struggling to keep up it really pushes on that button. And what they don't do is help you in your confidence and help you rise to the occasion and, and find your footing. Instead, they work you to the bone and it's, it's in a context of, if you don't know what you're doing, that's your problem, go figure it out, right? What are you stupid? <laughs> you know how many times I was told that in my first year as a lawyer? What are you stupid? You don't know how to do that? No. Oh, man. really? I'm so sorry. I mean, they weren't mean, mean, but they weren't like <laughs> I had I had a really good mentoring relationship with my first private law firm that I worked at. But when it came to like nurturing, there was no nurturing. It's not right. it's not lawyers don't get nurtured, right? We're not expected to be nurtured. I think we're more tortured. It's scene, tortured, right? not nurtured. You're not nurtured, well, you're tortured, and you just have to figure it out. <laughs> and the, the thing about confidence is it's really a connection to your own capacity, your own ability. You were hired or you were promoted or you were given the opportunity. So there is a foundational baseline of we know you can do this job, or we know you can grow to be really successful here. And then it's like ripped out from under you. <laughs> and so when I left the firm, what I realized was that I had no connection to myself, to my capabilities, to my power and my confidence and what I really wanted, you know, whether it was in the office or outside of the office. And so I think that a lot of times people in these professional capacities are very much just parroting and mirroring the people that they're trying to impress. And the people who they think have succeeded, how can I be more like them? Instead of saying, how can I be more like me and all the power that I possess and let that out? I love that. I want to ask you this. Now that you are a transformational coach and you do spirituality as more of your focus and working with people, what do you like the most about your change in your lifestyle with controlling your own, your own fate? Yeah, that's it. I <laughs> <laughs> answer your question for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely a change. It's really psychological. It's not actual, right? But it's a shift of feeling in control of your life, right? Oh. I'm not at the whim of anybody else. Oh, you know what else? I remember I've been working for myself as an attorney since 2008. So I've had the benefit of solo practitioner, but I'll say that I don't miss the idea of not having to start over as a lawyer in that career, because I didn't think that even law school for me was like a shock to the system. Cause I, you know, going to law school, spending all that money to become an attorney. And then you learn in those classes and you're a law student that you have to teach yourself the law. You don't learn the law. They don't teach you. They don't, they don't guide you to be a lawyer. You figure it out on your own. You pay them all the money and they give you these tests. They torture you with the Socratic method. And you got trial by fire with everything you do as a lawyer from the minute you start law school with the LSAT and do everything till the minute you probably are done being a lawyer later in life when you retire or die. And so <laughs> everything's trial by fire and there's never, and they put such a high burden on attorneys. No wonder why I think mental health is such an issue in our profession as attorneys. And I want to ask you, what do you think if you could go back or and I'll rephrase my question. If let's say the bar association you belong to contact you and said, Danielle, we would love to have you come in and do a wellness program for attorneys for a continuing legal education credit. We'd like you to incorporate what you've done since you've left the practice of law. And we wanted you to share your insight. 
What would you say at a CLE like that? What kind of information would you share with attorneys who are currently practicing that are devoid of spiritual connections in their life and who struggle each day to feel like they're doing the right thing for themselves? That's a really great question. I love that. I love yeah. that question. You know, the thing that comes up for me is that the wellness programs as I know them to be currently are very focused still on the outside in mm. focus on creating life balance around time management, making sure you can have dinner with your family, you know, go to the gym, whatever. That's all the external stuff, but creating wellness from the inside out is where I'm always pointed. And so I would start there. And in that really focusing on what is the nature of stress? Because we talk a lot about stress when, you know, as lawyers specifically and in a million other professions who are stressed out, right? And about managing it, about managing stress. What are ways in which I can handle my stress? And again, that's looking from the outside in. But when we can talk about what the nature of something is, you automatically shift your relationship to it and it changes immediately and permanently. And then you have actually more control over stress. I love that. I have to, I have to ask this because I have a fellow lawyer on the show who's also spiritual. You'll get this. Trust me. You'll probably laugh. I'll go first. If you could share <laughs> with the audience, as an attorney practicing law in DC, if you could share with the audience one of your craziest opposing counsel stories where the opposing counsel just made you scratch your head and say, no. Did that attorney just say that to me on the phone or in a hearing or in general? Did that attorney just do that? And I'm going to tell you an example. I've had a lot of them over the years. But one of my examples is I went against an attorney. And I won't say the state because, you know, there's a lot of lawyers in each state. But I went against a lawyer in one of my states. And the attorney had the inability or incapacity to talk personally or, or be able to connect with me as the attorney and saw me in an adversarial relationship no matter what. Like, I am like, hey, look. I've been doing this for 15 years. That's five years ago at this point. And your client and my client, it's in their best interest if we both try to settle this, negotiate this. Why don't we work together with one another? And this attorney, the words that this attorney, I won't even say the gender of the attorney. This attorney was like, no, I don't do that. I work you and I work until I can, I can get everything out of you that I can get. I can make your life difficult and then I settle or then I go to, you know, like the attorney was basically all or nothing with me all or nothing. Right. And it really made me rub my head. Like, why is this attorney doing that? You know, like I got a client, you got a client. And it's not either of our client's best interest to litigate the heck out of this case. Unless the fact you're just want to make money off your client. And you're not looking at it as zealously advocating for the interests of your client. Right. So that's an example. We ultimately did settle the case. Oh, and by the way, the attorney tried dropping an atomic bomb on me with, with motion practice, right? You know, when you have the, the various motions filed right, right before Thanksgiving and Christmas, it was that time of the year then. So we had to do all these responses during the holidays. We ultimately settled it. Was going, it's like going over hurdles at a race. You just got to jump, 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 jump. And so that's my example is that there are certain attorneys that love to make it so difficult because they're adversarial in nature, no matter what, they don't appreciate that you can actually get more done with honey than you do with vinegar, except for them, it's vinegar and acid. So I want a battery <laughs> acid. I want to ask you, what, what's been like uh, an example for you that you can share with us? You know, to be honest, I don't really have a great one. <laughs> I, I mean, I left being a commercial litigator because I'm not adversarial by nature and I never had a, an honest intention to get into commercial litigation from the get-go. I actually had really great relationships with all the attorneys on, <laughs> from the other firms that <laughs> I spoke with. But I do remember, you know, there's back channeling on both sides that happens. And I accidentally received an email that was intended to be a back channel from the opposing attorney to his team and I, he accidentally sent it to, you know, <laughs> other counsel on the other side. And it, it thankfully wasn't horrible, but it was basically like, you know, like screw these guys, something, something. And it just gave us a good laugh. And like, that was honestly a moment of levity that helped us as a team bond over something <laughs> that we could have a moment to be like, <sighs> okay. I've, 
I've had moments where I love being a lawyer, like when you can really make an impact on your client's life or you feel really good about, you know, evening the playing field. I do insurance, I do insurance law. So I sue insurance companies. So you got the Goliath insurance company against our side and we're, we're the insureds. And, and so that's where it's more adversarial, depending on the attorneys that really buy into the mindset of the insurance company with litigation, delay, deny, defend. So Mm -hmm. I will say this though, and I won't be keep talking about a lawyer the whole time. I just the first lawyer I had on the show in a while that shares the background similar to myself. So it's like, it's like, (laughs) it's like a kid, a kid in the candy store. I'm like, Oh my God, I want to focus on this instead. What do you think to anyone in the audience right now, who's contemplating taking the switch, you know, diving in the deep end, leaving a job that's a traditional job and deciding to do something like what you're doing. And I want to ask you, or what I do even as a psychic on the side, like, what do you, what do you say to somebody who wants to do a side hustle to turn it into their main hustle? And what advice or guides would you give to them from your journey? Look, I don't tell people what to do (laughs) in my role. I'm not going to say go for it because it was such a great decision for me. That's not my, my role. I I don't do that. But what I would say is whether you make a choice, yes or no, to pivot or leave what you're doing and go do something else, that's a really empowering choice to make. And so as opposed to shoving that discomfort or disappointment or dissatisfaction that you're feeling about what you're doing sort of under the rug and ignoring it because it's safer to be like you mentioned, sort of where you are and, and and just keep riding that ride to instead pull it out of the rug and really look at it and get right with yourself on what the choice is that you want to make. Like that takes courage. And so it doesn't really matter which way you go and you can always change your mind. It's just putting that conscious focus and attention on the choice. I can totally relate and connect to you on that. I want to ask you, what is resonant human consulting? Yeah. Resonant human is basically what I call being in alignment with yourself, being connected to your own inner wisdom. Like that is the strongest navigation for us. Everyone around us can offer advice to us about what to do to leave your job or not, or your partner or not, or, you know, your house or whatever get a dog, don't get a dog. Everyone has an opinion, but ultimately you're in charge of filtering those opinions and deciding for yourself what really speaks true to you. And so it's coming home to that space over and over and over again with micro decisions to macro decisions, to finding that place of trust and confidence in your own internal wisdom. So that's what I call resident human. And then the consulting piece is sort of what you mentioned in my bio about bringing that service to people in a professional capacity for their companies. What do you do with your corporate clients? I know you indicated that you do stuff with startups and you help them reach their potential and you do some leadership consulting. I was going to see if you could tell us a little about that and what kind of services you offer organizations or corporations and corporate clients. Yeah, this is really cool stuff because my passion is to be involved in these really cool leading edge futurist or social impact companies that have a vision for how they can create the future and what they're going to do about it. So whether it's in blockchain or psychedelics or space or whatever the industry, these are people who have grabbed the mantle of humanity and are pulling it forward into spaces that we could never even imagine. And how I'm involved with them is to keep them grounded in their truth too. Because when you run a company, you know, you're you're a CEO, your real job is to be the calm container of the chaos. And so you don't want to get caught up in all of that drama of what's going on in the day-to-day inside your company to as much as an extent as you can. And when you have to make decisions, a lot of times you can still get pulled. You're human. You get pulled in different directions. Do I hire this person? Do I do a fundraising round right now? Or do I work on my product development? There's a lot to decide. And so it's again, coming home to look, there might be a, a right answer, quote unquote, there probably isn't. It's just you getting really clear on what the right choice for you is and for your company is as a leader. 
When you work with clients in your capacity now, and they know that you're an attorney, how, how do you differentiate? Like I tell clients as a psychic that my lawyer hat comes off and I just put my spiritual psychic hat on. And then that's, and I even, did not, I even do it during times of the day. I'm like, anytime after five, right now we're earlier than that, but anytime after five, I put my psychic hat on and I'll either do my podcast or I'll do my, you know, psychic readings, but I don't mix the two because the way I analyze it is there's nothing in the ethics rule that says if you're a lawyer and you're spiritual, or if you're a lawyer and you're a psychic, these are the rules that apply to you. So I keep them regimented like that. <laughs> right. And I want to ask you, I know you're not actively practicing law right now in your, in your business. I don't think unless you are, but I want no, to, not. cause I don't, it just, it just doesn't seem like it would line up for us. I want to ask you, how do you differentiate that? If you have clients that want you to do both or have an interest, Oh, well, you've done this before in commercial in, in corporate litigation, commercial litigation. Can you help me with X? Like what, is there been a, a circumstance like that where you've had a client that wanted to do that if they're a commercial client or something? you know, for the most part, it's been really clear. I'm really clear with people about like what the relationship is and what that parameter or boundary looks like. And so I've never had someone ask me to put my lawyer hat on in that way. However, I have worked with people who are like, I just have a contract I need reviewed. Could you look at it for me? I know this isn't what we're doing together right now, but is there like a side thing that we could do together? And so whether I say yes or no is it's, it's more like this is a very separate container that we're talking about. Okay. Going into your background, I want to ask you, have you ever considered yourself to be intuitive? And if so, what type of intuition have you found that you, you enjoy or that you've had in your life in the past? Yes, absolutely. I have. <laughs> Going to school and getting a formal education really teaches the value of a rational, logical mind, right? And when we get really well trained to to that sort of left brain mentality, we forget how intuitive we naturally are, that innate ability that we all have within us. So leaving the law has actually helped me come back home to those intuitive capacities. And oftentimes with clients, I'll see there's as well come through because again, they're connecting to their, their inner wisdom and it shows up for them usually in an intuitive way. I tend to categorize intuition into the clear senses. I don't know if that's something that you want to get into, but there's, there's essentially the, the meta counterparts to our physical senses. So we have clear voyance, which most people are familiar of, and, and I tend to use this as an example, which all it means is clear seeing, right? Like, like people are like, oh, it means you can tell the future and you're this like mystical, crazy person. <laughs> but all it means is that when you receive intuitive information, it, you get it in an image or you see something or like people who are really creative, who are in the arts or are, are interior decorators or architects. They're clairvoyant. They're using and tapping into their clear vision of what they want to create in the world. I agree with that. And you know what? I was going to say, even when you're saying that, I'm not even thinking like professional athletes, right? They have to envision these plays and they got to do all these complicated performance things. Um, I feel like they have some type of clairvoyance or some type of intuition as well. We all have intuition. And I feel that intuition doesn't just mean Miss Cleo, <laughs> you know, call me up <laughs> yeah, or, or even myself reading people like anyone could have clairvoyance, right? Or any of the other right. clairs, clairsentience or Claire, I'm trying to think of other ones off the top of my head. I know I haven't written down somewhere and, and I, I talk about them enough, but for the purpose of our audience, they, what you're basically saying is we have the five physical senses and then there are spiritual or intuitive senses that are corresponding to that. So if you can see with your eyes, if you have the ability to get visions or, or picture things, then that's clairvoyance. If you can hear voices, and hopefully you're not being admitted somewhere, but you actually <laughs> legitimately pick up a voice or sounds, any kind of noise that would be- Musicians your- are clairaudient, yes. right? Yes. Or, or if you journal, if you're a person who has a, a journaling practice or you're a writer and you get into flow state with writing or the answers come for you in your journaling, that's clear audience. I mean, it's all about, it's not necessarily just about hearing. It's about communicating and getting clear communication through 
through usually writing or, or listening or hearing voices or something like that, but it doesn't have to be so like otherworldly. Exactly. Because that's what, like, that's what causes the problems for people to be like, this isn't for me. I can't cross this bridge with you. <laughs> this is crazy. Exactly. Exactly. I want to ask you this as an entrepreneur, as a thought lead, I call you, I'll call you a thought leader for now. I know you're not there yet, but you will be, you're going to have your own book coming out in the future. And I feel like you're yeah. author of your book. I see you're going to have people working with you in the future. I want to ask you this. What's your observations about breaking the glass ceiling, uh, allowing female entrepreneurs to really be on equal footing with male entrepreneurs in our society? And what do you think needs to be done in order for it to be really equal with one another between the sexes? Oh, thanks for the light question. <laughs> <laughs> if we talk about leadership qualities of what makes someone a good leader, it's all relative and subjective to the context of the time and space that we're in. So we've come from a time and space where we've really valued what we call masculine leadership qualities. And those are things like competition, assertiveness, confidence, and um, rational, logical problem solving. And that's how people who have risen as, a, as leaders who are women have done so through really tapping into those qualities. For example, a famous one being Hillary Clinton. Then as we shifted as a society into, oh, there's these other feminine qualities that are actually pretty cool and valuable. And maybe there's something to look at here, like empathy, collaboration, creativity. We've started to support and value women who show us those leadership qualities. And they're starting to become more prevalent. Then what we did was we turned on Hillary Clinton and we said, why are you so masculine? Why can't you be who you really are and be more feminine, assuming that she isn't being who she really is anyway? So she kind of got stuck in the crosshairs of societal shift from sole masculine leadership qualities being the one and only answer to becoming a leader to now more in a fluid way, embracing that there's just more than that to be celebrated about leadership. So as we continue to expand and embrace more of what makes a leader a leader, then more women will naturally rise to the top. Paradigm shifts. I love it. That's what I believe in too. I think paradigm shifts are what are needed. Like I grew up in a single parent family and my mom raised me. I had, you know, I've always accepted that women can be equal to men because, you know, it just makes sense to me. It just, a lot of pivotal figures in my life have been female leaders and, and like my two law partners are female. Like I, I just find that collaboration, empathy, and having one's ability to look at things and, and from the lens of what you'll call feminine leadership abilities. It's not really feminine leadership abilities. It's looking at things from a more rational, reasoned, measured approach. And when you can collaborate with one another as compared to compete, you know, the competition thing, it's like, doggy dog world, right? The per <laughs> you, you just don't. But then have... you're stuck in that paradigm and then exactly. everything is either eat or get eaten. Exactly. And that's not necessarily the way it is. It's just the way you perceive it. I love the way you answered that because that's how I see it as well. I think paradigms are going to change and that's, what's going to give the, the, the true catalyst to, to, to devour and destroy the glass ceiling finally once and for all. And I think that that is going to happen in our lifetime. I'm very confident in the next 15, 20 years, we're going to have some real success Me on too. that. And I'm excited. But also that. the question sort of assumes that the the structure of how businesses are going to continue to be created in the future are going to be the same, which is a traditional masculine hierarchical structure. And that can change too. Yeah, I think that will change. I think once we change the face of what is considered strong leadership, because as a strong leader, you don't have to be Mas like the masculine leadership roles don't necessarily mean strong leadership. You can, you can point to any successful woman like yourself or any entrepreneurial woman or any woman who's running an organization. And you could say, you know what? That's a strong leadership. That's an example of strong leadership. And mm -hmm. I, I practiced in different areas like Mississippi, Texas, and Alabama, the traditional, you know, 
the way things have been for many years. And I find it's interesting that as a male attorney that I was blown away by when it's like myself and another male attorney in the room. And then if a female came in the room, who's a lawyer, either on my side or the other side or whatever, it, you could tell that in different areas, people act differently amongst gender roles. And I would love to see a day when that's not the case. I'd love to see a day when it doesn't matter if you're male or female, if you're in a position like a lawyer or a business owner or an entrepreneur, you can do everything exactly the way you need to, because there's no preconceived notions and prejudices and negativity. And I, I hope that that's something we can start with the, I call a renaissance right now, right? What we've gone through with the pandemic, it's a spiritual renaissance right now. I think our society is really gearing up to understand not just mind, body, spirit, but look at spirituality as a bigger context of life. So many people have suffered during the pandemic. They're looking for relief. They're looking for a rational approach that doesn't tie them into the past. So I really do think paradigms can change right now. I think there's an ability that we could break down old norms, morals, and paradigms and create new opportunities for true growth here. And uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that's, that's like my, my wish someday. I, I want to ask you, what have you found to be the most rewarding part of your new practice as a transformational coach and as a, as a consultant? What have you enjoyed the most about it compared to what you've done previously as an attorney? Well, I mean, the biggest difference is that I wake up excited for the day, <laughs> <laughs> right? And that's really ultimately why we do, hopefully, anything that we do is because we enjoy ourselves in it for one reason or another, right? And, and that has a, such a ripple effect because when I wasn't waking up excited for the day, my health was poor, my mood was poor, my eating habits were poor, my relationships were poor. And so there's such a holistic benefit to waking up, just being excited to, to live your life, right? Yes, absolutely. hundred percent. What do you think about obstacles, failures, setbacks? How do you view those in your life? Oh, those don't exist. <laughs> I mean, of course they exist. Yeah. Um, but what, what I mean to say, go ahead. No, I get, I get it. I'm just being facetious with you. It's all right. You know, when I am in a place of seeing something as an obstacle or a failure, it's my mindset, right? It's my perspective of the event that occurred or the experience of it. And what that means is when I can catch myself doing it, it's, oh, I'm in a place of judging this too early, that there's more time to see how this unfolds or what this leads to. And I wanna count my chickens before they're hatched essentially. Because ultimately beneath the experience is the trust that everything is unfolding for my benefit and offering me exactly what I'm asking for. It really comes down to that kind of mindset of, are you going to judge your life? And if so, <laughs> then you're caught sort of in the paradigm we were talking about before of everything is either good or bad. And if you want to be in that paradigm, okay, okay, like that's your choice, but you don't have to be. And you can just sort of not stop judging it. And that's why I was being facetious of saying there's no such thing. <laughs> because when I'm in a place of being in alignment and really centered, there isn't. Because I've stopped judging or qualifying the experience. I tell people I work with or people I talk to, you know what? I have enough failures in my, in my life. I have enough setbacks and the obstacles, man, they're, they're, they've been in my, it's like chock full of nuts. I've had a cornucopia of obstacles in my life, but I'll say this. And, and this is something I've learned recently, actually, from doing interviews with amazing people like yourself. For me, failure now represents learning experiences. It's a, a failure can become even a failed relationship or a broken relationship, I should say, or a setback or someone taking advantage of you. All those have been learning experiences for me. And it's almost like I have gratitude now. With any of the failures of my past or my learning experiences of the past, I've greeted them now with a renewed focus of appreciation. Because if I didn't have all those setbacks and obstacles in the past, I probably wouldn't be appreciative of where I am right now. Mm. And waking up, like you said, when you wake up in a good mood and you're smiling, I'm a morning person to begin with, but 
I'd have to say the last six months, I've been smiling. With, I wake up with a smile on my face and I go to bed with a smile on my face for the most part. And I'm not one of those people that is just smiling all the time and that's it. I mean, obviously mental health is always an important part of, of being well-rounded and understanding your, your, your challenges and your, and what you're given. And so for me, that's, that's how I kind of conceptualize things is just having a positive mindset and being able to take negativity and channel it and, and really get to understand it. And I get revisionist like that. And I didn't know, do you like, do you look revisionist in your own way and look at things that from the past you look at now from a different set of lens, because you are where you are and you are able of to course. appreciate even the worst moments of your prior past or, or you know, the, the moments when you looked at them at the time, they would horrify you. And now I welcome, you yeah, yeah. something that looks like a tsunami in the past now looks like a little, little wash over wave. Yeah. I mean, as you practice that gratitude, it, well, I mean, two things. First, in the moments of suffering and in pain, you can also at the same time have that cognitive dissonance of holding gratitude for it too, because you know that at some point in the future, you're going to be able to look back on it and say, thank you. So why not just say thank you now? Right? Exactly. So there's that. <laughs> and then the second part of it is practicing that actually kind of helps you develop these shock absorbers, sort of like spiritual shock absorbers so that as you move through things that feel like challenges or obstacles or failures, well, they don't have the same you know, depressive pull on you that they used to, because you can move through them more gracefully. How did the pandemic shape your business goals? How did it shape your, your, your path? If it did at all, some people came through the pandemic and actually, you know, wrote books, expanded their business in other ways, were creative mm -hmm. in what they did. I was wondering, like, how did you, how did you get through the pandemic so far? And what have you, what have you learned from it? So I had my daughter January of 2020. Congratulations. Thank you. And so when officially COVID came to the U.S. and things were starting to lock down in March, I was still in the middle of being a new mom and I wasn't really focused on business. What it allowed for was my husband and I rented an RV because we didn't want to fly at that point. And we drove across the country with our daughter to my parents' house on the East Coast. We're in Texas. So we drove to my parents' house on the East Coast to live with them. We weren't ready to get a nanny or have help or bring anyone into the house. So how are we supposed to be parents and also get back into work? Well, we went to our, my parents and we lived with them for half a year. And it was the best thing that would have never happened had COVID not happened <laughs> because my, my daughter got to bond with her grandparents in a really cool way that she never would have otherwise. Right. I got really cared for as a new mom in a way that you know, like my husband was tired too. Like he was <laughs> just stringing along by his fingernail too. So all of a sudden there was this breath of fresh air and love and, and, and nurturing in our lives that really helped us get on track professionally when we were ready, when I was ready. And, you know, thankfully, everything has worked really well through the pandemic for us. AMA Healing, which is our, our hemp CBD brand, you know, it's been through very big highs and very big lows. And currently we're going through a new shift and change, which is really exciting. And, you know, the pandemic is absolutely a part of both the highs and the lows. And then with coaching, it really tested what I know to be true about life, which is that you can't control anything outside of how you show up, how you act, what you say, and where you put your focus. Everything outside that little pot <laughs> is an illusion if you think you're controlling it. And sure. the pandemic really smacked people in the face with that for the first time in a lot of people's lives. And so it is sort of offering the spiritual training boot camp to people, whether they realize it or not, which is how do I create life from the inside 
inside out because now I finally realized for the first time that what I thought that I had built this, this sort of sense of structure and safety and stability with you know, jobs or houses or you know, whatever they thought isn't necessarily true. Any curveball could come along and just knock it down. So how do I get right with myself and live a life that still feels grounded and safe? Well, that's the work I do. So uh, (laughs) what do you know? It it really helped me to anchor into that truth in a better, deeper way too. And then have really cool conversations with people about it in the moment as we're going through it on a global scale. You're right about that. There's a, it increases the need for your services. And for what I do too, it increases because a lot of people are, are, if they're not in tune with their spiritual side and they're going through this, flux of transition and change, right? Because that's what the pandemic also represents is, is a lot of change, a lot of transition, not the kind of change people want to welcome. Like you shut down your business, you lose your job, you get sick, you lose a family. Those are changes that we don't like. Moving, you know, fall, I, I can tell you most people that have gone through these struggles, you can offer reassurance, clarity. That's what I do as a, in terms of what I do on the side. I call it my side hustle because my lost stuff is my main hustle. But having the ability to offer that clarity and reassurance just even for a few minutes to somebody when everything else is so chaotic like we talked about earlier the chaos right it's like the storms outside and they come meet with you or me and they get to come inside out of the rain and out of the the torrential downpour of uncertainty and Mm -hmm. we give them that certainty we give them that ability to kind of reconceptualize the reality of what they're going through and from my vantage point i've learned that patience is such a commodity that if you can learn to really appreciate patience and divine timing and let things take their course to go with the flow, like the water rush, you know, coming off of the duck's back or whatever you want to call it. Like if you can let things kind of flow sometimes, that's a, that's a superpower. It's a hidden superpower, but it's a superpower because you can let things, even if you can't control things, but you can control how you conceptualize it, what kind of paradigm you afford to it and also how you react to it. And those are powerful things for us. And that's why I think there's such a need for your line of work and your expertise and your unique perspective. I want to ask you, you're welcome. I want to ask you, uh, these interviews go fast sometimes because I get into the flow with you as a, as a guest and I'm loving it. We're already almost at the end of time, if you can believe that. But I want to I ask you, how can our audience find you? Oh, they can find me on my website, which is my name daniellesunberg.com and I'm sure it'll be spelled out in the in the episode now that's yeah that's the best way to find me okay and I, just so you know for our audience I'm going to have your contact information in the show notes I'm going to have your where they can find you on Facebook Instagram your email as well as your LinkedIn so and your website okay and there's so many places that you can find me <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about the future of coaching, the future of guiding others in the spiritual realm. How do you see it's going to, how do you think it's going to change in the future, the the immediate future and long-term? In the immediate future, what seems really clear to me is that more people are going to hire a coach. We've sort of crossed the threshold of destigmatizing therapy. I love that. (laughs) Right. And going to a therapist when you're moving through something or you're trying to untangle your past. And now I think coaches are the next ones. You know, I'll say this to you. I've learned more about the value of coaching through my show because I have some amazing coaches that come on. And just like athletes are coached to be their full potential, I tell people, if you feel like you want to reach your full potential, you need to call someone like Danielle. You need to check out transformative coaches who are spiritual, who are grounded, and who have the capacity to give you an outside point of view and walk you through the steps that you might not always do yourself. And I, I got to see that firsthand today. I think I told you before our interview, I had I had someone come in and organize me this morning at my house. And normally, you know, I don't think of how that is valuable, but it is so valuable. Like I'm walking around my house right now, I feel lighter because all this paperwork that was all over my table, I have a really big dining room table. And of course, after being here for a year working all the time, I've had that paper cover all the edges of that table. And right now it's a marble mm-hmm. table and I can actually see my tabletop and I feel good because I'm like, 
the direct recipient of what it could feel like to be coached in a positive way. And so I value that. And I, I thank you for taking this as your career path and making decisions to not only better yourself, but to work with others and help others where they really need the guidance and help and support. And so it's so exciting to see someone like you in this line of work because you have the ability to take your skill set and apply it over a long span. To, I mean, in your career now, you can make such an impact and difference in the lives of others who need your services. And that's what I think you're going to find as time goes on even more, your value is going to go up, your demand's going to go up, and you're going to see so many opportunities unfold for you because of what you're doing right now. So in that respect, I'm extremely happy that we have the ability to offer coaching services to people, to offer, like you said earlier, to, to end the stigma of mental health awareness, right? I can't tell you that how valuable of a, of a change, of a paradigm shift that is in our society, that everyone's gone through some level of a mental health issue in the last year and a half, the, the sadness, the despair, the whatever it is. I'm sure there's mostly a lot of people in our audience that's gone through that. And being able to tell somebody, why don't you go to a counselor? It's like going to the gym when you work out your muscles. You go to a counselor, you're working out your mental health. You're working out your self core. You're working out your, your, you know, like your core for your belly and your, and your, your body. You have a, a mental core that you're going to work out and, and improve and work on. And I just think that those kind of changes, they might be subtle right now because they're not, you know, it's not like you, you put on CNN and you see a big headline that says the stigma of mental health is eroding. <laughs> and now we are all embracing holistic care, right? You don't see headlines like that. But from our vantage point, just the fact that we're talking today for my show and that you're offering that as your own viewpoint, separate from what I've even said, tells me that there's growth in that area. There is going to be a destigmatizing, okay? I'll just say it like that. And even just professional athletes coming out and, and, and raising awareness and, and talking about their own examples, those are all powerful, powerful things. And I the think fact the, that, the fact ahead. that Marianne Williamson could be on the presidential stage yes. at all is a huge mark of, of progression in, in society. Yeah. Right. I think, yeah. 20, 30 years ago, people would say Kumbaya. They joke about it. They wouldn't take it seriously. And now I think people are saying Kumbaya, thank God. Kumbaya. We can all, we can all work together. We can collaborate. We can work to, to our collective benefit. So I, I could say that as well. I, I, I love the, changes and shifts that are occurring in our society right now for the better. And that is the embracing of spirituality and the embracing of collaborative, creative exercises and, and the chance to really work together. I think that's, what's going to get us out of these trying times as well. Absolutely. And also the, the trying times are giving us the expedited training to then shift into these positive places. Absolutely. I want to ask you this. If you are in a, if you were in an elevator and you were stuck in an elevator for an hour with anyone in your life that you could bring in there to talk to and learn from, who would it be and why? Stuck in an elevator. Huh, I've never thought about it like that. That's a good one. <laughs> you want me to go first? Sure. I don't mind. I would probably say that I would love to be in an elevator with my own father. I'm going to tell you why. I never had a relationship with him growing up. We never, we never, he was a very flawed person, drugs, alcohol, physically abusive, my mom, all that kind of stuff. So I never had a relationship and he died in 2012. And as a medium, he's appeared to me in several dreams and he's always asked for forgiveness. And it took the pandemic and being alone a lot and meditating a lot and letting go a lot and forgiving a lot that finally I said, you know what, dad, I forgive you. And he's come to me in dreams since in supportive ways. And so if I had an opportunity to actually have a physical conversation with him in an elevator after the apology and after the forgiveness, I think it'd be an interesting dynamic because I would be able to catch up with him as an adult, even though I still communicate with him through dreams and you know, passive ways. So that would be my example. Mm, that's really tender. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I hope you get more in the dreams too. It can add up to sort of an hour at an elevator, right? Well, between you and I, my grandfather always filled the role my dad. And actually here's synchronicity from our vantage point. My grandfather, the anniversary date of his death is today, August 12th. And like my address is 812. <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of secret. My, my nephew's birthday is also today. So my nephew was born many years after my grandfather died on the same day. So we celebrate his birthday. We recognize my grandfather. And it's also the day I, be, I first became alert 
that I was intuitive as a medium and all that. So today's a special day all around. And I wanted to ask you, what do you do when it comes to synchronicity? Have you recognized synchronicity in your life? Have you seen different forms of it? And what do you think of it when it comes up? Oh, I love that. First, I'll answer the elevator question. Okay. Oh, yeah. Good call. <laughs> which is, you know, I almost am resisting the answer because it feels so obvious to me that this is my answer that I'm like, oh, come on. Can I pick someone like more interesting? <laughs> because, well, you know, um, he's always my answer. That's why. Is Ram Das. Okay. And why? So Ram Das, for those who don't know, is a sort of a spiritual guru and he started off his life as a Jewish psychology professor at Harvard who then after you know teaming up with the McKenna's did a ton of acid in the 60s and took a pilgrimage to India hooked up with his guru Maharaji and found the deeper meaning of what it means to be human that he thought he had found in psychology he came back from India and has since become a thought leader, a prolific author and speaker on on spirituality, sort of bringing the East and bridging it to the West. So I find a lot of resonance with his journey in the way of he started in this very you know traditional, prestigious, not corporate, but you know the academic version of that of that path, and then sort of left it all behind and sought something more fulfilling, and then came back and, and shared it with his, shared his wisdom with whoever was willing to listen. And that journey feels sort of like a kind of classic spiritual hero's journey. And one that resonates with me. So first of all, there's that. Secondly, I, I would just love to be one-on-one in the same energetic space with him and in space and time. I've only gotten to see him as um, a person on a screen at a conference because he couldn't be there in person and in my dreams. And so to actually get to spend time with him in an elevator with no distractions, because, Hey, an elevator offers you nothing, right? Yeah. No distractions. You captive audience, both of you. And yeah, I just think that would just have so much juice. There'd be just so much there to, I would hate for the elevator doors to open. (laughs) You know what? I have a feeling if you spend an hour with him in the elevator, you'd both have a transformative experience and you'd never be the same again because you'd have that opportunity to learn so much from him in 60 minutes. I'm sure of it. Right? And he'll learn from you as well. I'd love that. (laughs) I could be, I would be so honored. Um, so then remind me of the synchronicity yeah, question. I was going to ask you, I, was gonna say, I brought up the fact that today's the anniversary day of my grandfather passing. And it's also me being a psychic and it's my nephew's birthday and my address lines up all those. I have synchronicity all the time. Anytime I talk to somebody in a reading, it's always one, 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 two, 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 three, 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 you know, whatever. But there's also synchronicity with, with songs and, and stories and thoughts and beliefs. It's, I mean, synchronicity has many layers. And I'll give you one other example. My grandfather comes to me in dreams. And a few months ago, when I was still kind of struggling through the pandemic, he told me on a Thursday, it was a Thursday like today, he told me when I woke up at 7 a.m., pay attention to what happens today. You're going to know some synchronicity that's giving you some messages of the future. So don't feel discouraged, right? So I woke up, I'm going about my daily routine, working at the house. That was the day that I got a new referral source for my law firm. So we had new business coming in there. Now, keep in mind, I'm not leaving my house in the midst of the pandemic. I'm sitting on my couch, right? So at like 10 o'clock, I get a new referral to talk about new cases. So I was excited about that. Then I wound up getting new opportunities with my show that I did not expect that were just like blowing up, opening up, those kind of things. And then I wound up getting like four new readings requests in like an hour. And I sat back for a minute. I'm like, I what grandpa means now he wants me to look at the, the look at the flow look at the trends that your life's offering you don't think of the immediacy of oh my god you know the pandemic's so uncertain and oh my god i have these bills and oh my you know all that kind of stuff take a step back from that for a minute it's like hit pause right take a step back kind of go backwards not backwards step 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 away and look at the big picture. You're getting new business on your one on your law firm, new opportunities with your show that you love so much, and you're getting new clients for your psychic business. He, he basically said to me is, look ahead, don't look backwards. 
And that was from synchronicity between his message that morning and what happened that day. So that's a higher level example, but I wanted to see like, what are your viewpoints about synchronicity in your own well, your own life and how it's guided shit, you know, directed you and, and inspired you. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I would start with a proposition that everything is energy, right? Yeah. We know from you to a tree, to the chair you're sitting on, it's all made up of energy and that's where it starts. And then things manifest from there into the physical world. So if we start with a thought and then it inspires you to say it out loud and all of a sudden the vibration comes out of your vocal cords and it becomes something that is audible by somebody else. And then maybe you do something about what you're saying and now there's action in the world. So there's this momentum of how energy manifests into physicality. And when we notice synchronicities in our life or what, you know, people would call sometimes luck or coincidence, whatever you want to call it. It's serendipity, really right? Serendipity. Yeah. To me, I would just say that it's you in a moment of time locking in vibrationally exactly with what it is that you'd like your desire. <laughs> A lot of times we are far apart from what we want. We want, you know, a better job or a partner, but we're in a feeling of, of lacking that. And so that is a vibrational discord of the vibration of the thing itself, of the energy of, of having it and the energy of not having it are not, you know, in alignment. But when you're fully in flow, like you were talking about, like when you're in that space of like sort of the whole world disappears and you're just in that present moment, Power. that's when we tend to notice the synchronicities when we like kind of come out of the flow and we're like, oh, boom, 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 boom. And look at all of this. It's all lining up and everything just seems to be unfolding perfectly today. Well, why is that? Well, you had no resistance. You had nothing pulling you out of the vibration that you wanted to be in. I love the way you just answered that. <laughs> Honestly, I, it resonates with me because I, I agree that when you're in balance and harmony with yourself and your goals and you're aligned, the universe will reward you and it'll bring things with ease to you. I tell people, as soon as I let go of the negativity, like with my dad, I forgave him and I let go of that negativity. You let go of that bad energy, right? That, that negative energy that's rooted in you. The universe is going to find ways to bring positive energy to you. It's going to fill that void with new experiences, new people. If you're unhappy because you had a breakup and you're stuck on it and you can't get past it, once you let go of that, you're going to eventually meet someone new. Or if you're stuck in a job that you're unhappy with and you decide you want to be able to start working for yourself, you're going to find new opportunities. So I, I, I believe synchronicity is kind of like a way that the spiritual communicates with us in certain very subtle ways. That if you're able to look for the signs and the cues, you'll notice that you're on the right path. It's almost like a, 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 a lighthouse. It's, it, it's, it helps to, to kind of lead you in a certain way. And also with the pandemic, I'll bring this up just because where we are right now. If people are able to take a step back from the, the chaos of the moment and realize that this is just a fleeting thing, it's like turbulence on an airplane, right? The chaos of the pandemic is going to eventually give way to stability and future opportunity. And if you're able to take that and appreciate it, the things that you're going through right now aren't going to impact you as severely. You're going to have an ability to really be flexible with your approach and appreciate what is coming up ahead and not instead of being fearful of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And the chaos of the pandemic is only chaotic because we had a certain expectation that the outcome of every day would be a certain way based on the right. way it was in the past. If you can let go of that attachment to what the day needs to look like to offer you safety and stability, then you open yourself up to whatever the day may look like can offer safety and stability. Exactly. Exactly. We're running low on time. So I want to ask you, if you were a spirit animal, which spirit animal would you be and why? I love this question. <laughs> I was playing a game with, with my husband and some friends. That was, uh, it was like a card game for smoking weed. So it was basically, you know, like crazy questions that, you know, when you get into that fun mindset, you can like just sort of riff in a, in a fun place. And that was, that was sort of a question on the card. And so I'm reminded of my answer to it, which was a fire breathing unicorn. Okay. I love that. <laughs> because it sort of, to me is this, 
spirit animal <laughs> analogy of the wisdom, believe in Allah and tie up the camel. Okay. Which is like the unicorn is the trust, the faith, the hope, the the rainbows and butterflies sort of, of just sort of surrendering into the universe and all the mystical, fantastical things that are possible. But also like if it breathed fire, that would be an extra layer of protection. <laughs> I'm thinking Game of Thrones dragons when you say breathes fire. <laughs> I'm thinking yeah, so much like power that. as a unicorn that breathes fire because you got the benefit of everybody. Going, oh, wow, a unicorn. They're so rare and beautiful and unique and majestic. And then if you get crossed the wrong way, you're protected. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly. Great. And you'd never have to worry about being cold on a winter night. <laughs> That's very out. important. Give off some heat. So I love that. Yeah. I always say owl because of the wisdom. An owl. And, yeah. I always say owl in every episode. I should probably change that up sometimes. Cause if people listen to my past episodes, they're going to know what I'm going to say, but <laughs> it's because I have, but two it is parents. what it is. It is what it is. You know, I just say it's because I have two parrots. I grew up with parrots. I like birds, but I'm all about wisdom. I'm all about expanding paradigms, looking beyond the immediacy of right now and, and being able to look beyond things. And so that's where I, I call that my spirit. Mm, I like that. Yeah. Cause owls also not only are wise, but they have that really flexible neck. Right. Yeah, they can turn around, look at everything from 180 degrees from where they were before. And that's yeah, the they have that expanded like, perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Daniel, I want to thank you for coming on and, and I appreciate you sharing your information with our audience and your background and, and the wealth of insight that you offer today. And, and I would love to have you come back once you write your book that I see you writing at some point in the future. And I would love to have you back on as an open platform for you to know that I would love, I, I just, I just love your energy. And I think what you're offering the world right now is so important and so needed. And so by coming on the show and sharing your voice with us and just our benefit of a prior conversation, I'm all about making connections and, and developing relationships with very like-minded people. You're one of those. So I would love to have you keep in touch with me and to definitely maintain our ability to, to, to have this dialogue because it is that critical to me. And I love the fact that you, you know, you're pursuing your own path right now. You're a trailblazer. Can't say much more than that, right? It, it, it's, it's an amazing opportunity. And I think you're going to really fill voids for a lot of people that you work with going forward that you already have. So thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Jason. And I would be happy to come back. I have so much fun chatting with you. So any, <laughs> any, any more would be great. I make a joke. I told my mom, my mom's like, how was your interviews today? <laughs> Cause sometimes I do more than one show and I'll be like, mom, it's like, it's like when I was a little kid and used to take me over to so-and-so's house. I feel like I have play dates. I feel like I get to talk spirituality and everything I'm passionate about with some amazing people. And I feel like, oh yeah. And I create episodes as a result of the interviews I do. Cause you, you can, you can vouch for this when you're a lawyer and you work in private practice, what do we do as lawyers in civil litigation? We take depositions, right? So we get paid to come up with questions, to ask people under oath, usually as a technique to help further your case. Well, anybody who's gone through that in their legal sense can come in front of a, a microphone, a camera and a video and I, I love asking questions to people, as you could tell, and I love getting information to share with my audience. So it, it lines right up with what I've done the last 20 years of my life, except I get to ask questions I like to ask, not that I have to ask, <laughs> right? Well, it shows because I know I'm not the only person that's had a great time here. So. <laughs> I just want to thank Danielle Sundberg for coming on the show today and sharing her amazing skill sets with us. Being a litigator and an attorney and then deciding to choose your own path to become a transformational coach, an entrepreneur, a Reiki master, those are critical. Check out Danielle, check out her information and stay positive because when you're positive, anything's possible. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Social Psychic Radio Show. Don't forget to join us for another episode next time. If you enjoyed the show, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate and give us a review on iTunes. You can also check us out on Facebook and don't forget to visit the Social Psychic YouTube channel. Until next time, it's a big world out there. Keep an open mind, embrace your paradigms and know that the universe is always yours to explore.